Does freedom of speech matter to you? I don't just mean in terms of civilization, but even specifically, does freedom of speech matter to your health? Well, my next guest does. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. So my next guest is none other than Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. And uh, Jay is a, uh, an incredible leader as we've had uh, common sense to bear as a physician, an epidemiologist, a uh, public policy health expert, and also one of the co-authors in October 2020 of the Great Barrington Declaration, along with uh, Dr. Martin Kulder from Harvard and also Dr. Sunita Gupta from Oxford. So Jay comes from us from uh, Stanford University and welcome, Jay. Thank you. So good to be here, David. Thank you for inviting me. Well, it's a pleasure, and, and we're so glad we can continue our conversations over the last uh, while on so many fronts. And, I, you know, there's so many bombshells that seem to be going off that kind of, as they, as they click off, um, they bring more clarity to what's happened the last three years, and it's really quite stunning. But I, I, so I'm really excited about going through those and, and you can help us understand what's, you know, your perspective. Um, so I did want to look at the, a little bit of a basic introduction here for people that may not be familiar with you, uh, because you have a kind of a worldwide following now with, with uh, your other co-authors of the Great Barrington Declaration. But I do want to ask you, why did you write the Great Barrington Declaration? Can you, can you summarize for people what the significance of that is? Sure. So the so, so Great Barrington Declaration basically uh, argued in a one page, very, very easy to read document that the lockdowns that we had been following in, uh, we brought it in October 2020, uh, that the lockdowns we'd followed in the spring of 2020 and that that were coming, obviously coming in 20, uh, later in 2020 in the, as the winter wore on, uh, that they were a tremendous mistake that had harmed the poor, the vulnerable, the working class people, that they had uh, that, they, that, that they were ineffective at protecting vulnerable older people from COVID itself. And so we, we call the Great Barrington Declaration called for focused protection of vulnerable older people and lifting of lockdowns uh, based on the scientific evidence that at the time it was, the, it was clear to us that that was the right strategy. Okay, so we, you basically emphasized, dare I say, best practices when it came to public health policy. Is that right, Jay? <laughs> that, that, was, that was our goal. I mean, I think, David, the, the thing is, it, it, the, if you look at the Great Barrington Declaration, it's not actually all that original a document. I mean, mm -hmm. I like it. it it's, it's, I think it's quite important, but probably my favorite thing I've ever been involved with. Uh, but the, 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 it essentially outlined the old pandemic strategy that we'd followed for a century of mm -hmm. respiratory virus pandemics. Uh, we wanted to shatter the illusion the, uh, that, that had been sort of that was prevalent that lockdowns were a scientific consensus. We wanted right. to tell people that legitimate scientists were op in opposition to the, the lockdown strategy and that there was an alternate strategy, focused protection of vulnerable people that was available that would have protected human life better. Exactly. So they kept bleating out these health authorities and others that were following the science, were following the science, and there's a consensus on this. There's no debate about this, but that was just utter tripe, wasn't it? It was. A lot of scientists had difficulties and problems with the lockdown strategy. The lockdown strategy was an enormous ex scientific experiment, unprecedented in history, mm -hmm. to lock down the, the societies of the world at scale for such a long time. Uh, and it was very clear to us in October 2020 when we wrote the declaration that the lockdowns were coming back, that, the, that, they, failed, that they failed to stop... COVID from spreading in spring of 2020, that they'd caused tremendous damage, especially to the poor of the world, especially to children. And that, the, that the, the same strategy to push lockdowns in the world, to pretend as if there was no scientific opposition to them, was going to be used again to push lockdowns. Uh, and so that's, that is the reason, the primary motivation for writing the Great Barrington Declaration. Indeed. So well done and, and bravo. And, you know, certainly in retrospect, um, you were right. I mean, there's no, there's no question, and, and the facts prove it. So, um, you know, for those who have not read the Great Barrington Declaration, be sure to read it. I think some uh, millions have, 
Uh, so it's worth, worth uh, looking at for sure. So this has continued to be, as we wind up 2023 and get into 24, a year of bombshells. Um, and I want to begin with, uh, in the Canadian context, and that is the National Citizens Inquiry tabled their massive report on November the 28th, and certainly made history as they did a, a, a coast-to-coast tour of hearing hundreds of witnesses, including expert witnesses, including yourself, on really um, the, the findings and the impacts of COVID-19 management on, on Canadians. And it was uh, really quite a revelation, very moving. And one of the things that they emphasize in the report is um, the so-called admissions of, of facts that have really come out. And I um, and really appreciate your help in trying to understand this. So one of them has to do with the so-called health and effectiveness of the vaccines. And one of the things that, that has come out, and, and Health Canada admits this, is that the vaccines themselves are... Um, uh, adul- adulterated. They have contaminants in them of DNA, no less. So why would DNA be in vaccines? Help us understand this. You, you understand the manufacturing of this and how they scaled up on these things, but should that be a, a concern to people, that revelation? Okay, so this is a, uh, a fact that's come out just in the last few months. Uh, there was a scientist named Kevin McKernan who uh, he's, he's a bona fide expert in uh, DNA sequencing. He, in fact, he was part of the, the human genome, a very uh, important par- person in the human genome project and led the marijuana genome sequencing project. Um, so he, he has a, a lot of expertise in G- uh, DNA sequencing and uh, bi- molecular biology. Uh, he uh, had some vials of the Pfizer vaccine left over that so and he decided that he was just gonna I guess he was just this is how scientists work sometimes you have an inspiration you say okay, let's just play around so he he tried to see if there was DNA in the Pfizer vaccine vials that were left over that he had available to him um, now why would there be DNA there, sh- there really shouldn't be DNA in these vials these are, this is an mRNA vaccine it's an mRNA product encased in a uh, uh, lipid nanoparticle, which is like essentially like just think of it as like a little sphere that encases the the, R, the mRNA, which then delivers the mRNA to the cells that then causes your cells to react uh, to produce the, the antigens that then your body reacts to that causes the immune reaction mm-hmm. that produces immunity. That's the that's the whole sequence. Nowhere in that sequence is DNA. It's all uh, and the idea, the reason is partly because. Uh, the mRNA is supposed to be degraded rapidly. It's not your body isn't supposed to keep producing the, the 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 spike proteins. It's just supposed to produce it and then essentially be degraded and be gone. DNA can has the potential to last longer. There's there's lots of reasons um, that you wouldn't necessarily want DNA in these in these in these vaccines. Um, so how did now when Kevin tr- played with these vials, he found DNA there. Um, and I remember he he, he he contacted me, told me this result, and I was I was really surprised by it. Um, but I was waiting to see if there was going to be replication of the result. Mm-hmm. And uh, a, a few months, a couple months later, uh, a, a, a professor in South Carolina, Philip Buckholtz, found exactly the same thing independently of of of, uh, of, of McKernan. Um, he found DNA in the uh, in the in the in the in the vials that he had left available to him. And, and to be clear, replication is is obviously critical in terms of confirming the science behind this. Yeah, and then later, I think Health Canada found the same exact result, DNA in the vials. So these are this is not like a a conspiracy theory. This is like essentially like a a, a now replicated scientific result. So the question is why? How did it get there? Uh, and the answer is is really uh, it's imp- it's 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 a little bit technical, but it's important so that people understand exactly what happened, uh, especially if they if they if they're worried or if they took the va- the, the, the vaccines. Um, so when they ran when Pfizer ran the randomized trials for the vaccines, they used a process to produce the mRNAs that was very very clean. It didn't involve the, any DNA at all. And so most of the people, in fact, everyone in the trials that got that got the vaccine got the vaccine with this clean process. They called it process one that produced the, an, an mRNA snippet that's specific for producing the, the snippets of the pr- spike protein that was the, that they wanted for the for the production of this vaccine. Um, 
And uh, so the people in the, in the randomized trials were evaluated based on a process that didn't have any DNA contamination in it. Now, th th there were about 40,000 people in the trial. The process of making the vaccine when you are doing it at, 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 th th with this clean process is expensive and slow. And it's fine, I guess, when you make it for 40,000 people. But then when you, when you send the vaccine to billions of people, you can no longer just use that slow process. Mm -hmm. You need a different process to produce the vaccine. Uh, you want, ideally, you want a vaccine that's bio, bioequivalent to the process we we'll used in the trial, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what, what Pfizer did was they used uh, a, a process that's actually often used for, uh, d d for producing, um, for instance, human insulin at scale. They took bacteria, inserted a, something called a DNA plasma. A DNA plasma is like a circular piece of DNA mm -hmm. that bacteria uptake. And then the bacteria just turn into little factories. They'll produce whatever the, the DNA plasma tells it to produce. And so that's what it did. So they, 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 they inserted a DNA. Pfizer took some DNA plasmid, put it into bacteria, fed the bacteria. The, then the bacteria then produced the mRNA uh, product. And then they purified the mRNA product out of this bacterial slurry. And then that's what was sent to people worldwide. That's what was injected to people worldwide for the products of this, this bacterial process, uh, manufacturing process. The, the problem is that the DNA plasmid that they used to instruct the bacteria about what, what they wanted the bacteria to make, this mRNA product, that was stayed contaminated in the vials. That's the DNA that they were finding. It was this bacterial plasmid used to, to produce and manufacture the vaccine at scale. Wow. So, that, so just to be clear then, so the initial approval process was a, quote, clean process. And then when they went to the large numbers, they scaled up. They used, obviously, a different process. And they came out with, arguably, a different product. Is yeah, that a I mean, fair uh, comment? That is absolutely a fair comment, right? So uh, I think one of the things that, uh, if, I, if I understood the Health Canada report correctly, is that, that, that Pfizer, in its reports to Health Canada, in, in, in order to gain a, initial approval, made it very difficult to find. I think they did actually reveal that they used this other process, but they made it very difficult to find uh, what was in the, the, the DNA plasmid. And the reports, they didn't do a sufficient job uh, essentially documenting that they had uh, removed the vaccines of this this contaminant, right there. And in fact, uh, one of the results I've I've seen from uh, Buckholz and McKernan, and uh, is, is that the level of DNA contamination is higher than you would uh, would the the, the the normal safety levels for other similar products mm -hmm. would allow. Uh, I'd say one other thing, like those normal safety levels are set based on DNA being in in a in a product. That's those are set based on uh, not on vaccines that have a vehicle to deliver the vaccine into cells, this mm -hmm. lipid nanoparticle. They're yeah. just based on, you, you know, when you eat meat or you eat vegetables, you're eating DNA. That's There's nothing like magical about that. Mm -hmm. Your body knows how to process it. But what we don't know is if you have this DNA plasmid inside a lipid nanoparticle that is designed to be delivered essentially into the cells, into cell cytoplasm and potentially even into nuclei, nuclei uh, what will that do? Mm -hmm. What will that what accomplish? Now, so you asked me at the beginning, what are the health consequences? And I have to say the answer is, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that because no one's, no one's ever studied this before. But to be clear, uh, no one's ever studied this. And the question is, why the heck are these vaccines being promoted for public consumption into your body? I mean, surely they should be pulled off the, the shelves. I mean, is this not a, a kind of a, dare I say, a bait and switch? I mean, I, th I think, well, so from one, the, like the vaccine vials they were testing on are no longer on the market. Those are from the original vaccines that were out in 2021. So uh, the question is whether there's still DNA contamination. I think that's an open question for the new vaccine, the new mm -hmm. uh, booster vaccines. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know. I, and I, I think it's unlikely that they're causing uh, huge amounts of health problems at scale. But you can tell biological or molecular biological stories about how this vaccine, the DNA contamination, can lead to 
uh, severe health problems. It's not, it, I don't, I, don't, I think it's very likely going to be rare if it, they do, but who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, at the very least, these are questions that our regulators should have asked Pfizer to answer before recommending the vaccine at scale. Indeed. So this is where uh, this is not over. We need to ask these incisive questions for the sake of people's health and, and of course, safety. So that is a very significant revelation. And then that moves us into another area, which was um, uh, the state of Texas uh, just uh, came out with a, a massive lawsuit against Pfizer. And the, um, in the release, it says Pfizer engaged in false, deceptive and misleading acts and practices by making unsupported claims regarding the company's COVID-19 vac vaccines in violation of the Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Act. So it's fascinating. They're going after Pfizer, the large drug juggernaut that is uh, really calling them out on, on product effectiveness. Uh, is that a surprise to you? No, I'm, it's not a surprise. I mean, the only the only question is whether uh, it's Pfizer or the or the governments that bought, that essentially indemnified Pfizer to primarily blame. I, I, I guess it'd be funny to for the state of Texas to sue the the, the FDA, but in principle they could. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, or, or, I think um, or the NIAID or something. Um, the the issue is, I think, the overstatement of the efficacy of the vaccine is very clear. I think I, 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 you know, in 2021, I remember Albert Borla, the CEO of Pfizer, uh, giving, you know, essentially interviews where he would claim that the vaccine stopped you from getting COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, the evidence in the trials didn't justify that. The, the evidence in the trials looked at prevention of symptomatic infection, but didn't look at prevention of all infection. Uh, and, and in fact, it's possible to get COVID and get uh, have a very few symptoms or no symptoms, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it didn't look at whether it stopped disease transmission. The trial, in other words, the randomized trials in 2020 did not justify the claims that Albert Borla was making about the vaccines in 2020. Indeed, One. yeah. So stay tuned on that that lawsuit because an interesting thing to that Texas lawsuit is that um, it also accuses Pfizer, uh, if I understand it correctly, of basically working to help censor the truth regarding the efficacy of those uh, vaccines. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a big one. So that's, that's uh, significant. And I, I think the next one uh, is a very interesting case, and that has to do with the uh, First Amendment, uh, freedom of speech again. And this relates to uh, the lawsuit Missouri versus Biden, as in the president, uh, Joe Biden. Um, and this is just a, a big one where the, the case, and you were involved in this, and I want to get to that in a moment, Jay. Uh, this case has uncovered astonishing evidence of a, um, a team of censors in the U.S., and this has big implications for Canada, that would make, frankly, communist China almost blush, I suspect, because it involves 67 uh, agencies uh, really strong arming every area of the tech sector on on social media. Um, it's and I think the judge even said this is like 1984. And and I encourage people to read the judgment uh, because uh, this just says, wow, this is uh, obviously censorship in full action. So how were you involved in this case, Jay? It's a fascinating one. So I'm a plaintiff in the case, actually, David. So uh, the the uh, the Missouri and Louisiana Attorney General's Office brought the case in August of 2022 against the Biden administration. Uh, the allegation was exactly as you said the, that 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 the Biden administration had set up a a process to to uh, to censor ideas and people online, especially ideas uh, ideas and people uh, that criticized Biden administration priorities regarding COVID. And uh, what what uh, what we the judge in the case that it was brought in a federal uh, 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 district court mm -hmm. in Louisiana. The judge in the case, looking at the evidentiary record, uh, essentially said uh, basically I mean, he had not basically actually wrote that, that in the conclusion to the, the, the decision that that the Biden administration has set up a something like a ministry of truth, an Orwellian ministry of truth. Uh, the discovery in the case, what we found is that. Uh, agencies like the CDC, the Surgeon General's Office, the uh, the the uh, uh, even the FBI, mm -hmm. the, the, and the White House itself would would 
go to social media companies and tell them, here's a list of people and ideas to censor. And not, and not just censor in terms of like remove off the platform, but also de-boost, uh, make sure that do, do all kinds of like crazy shenanigans just to make stunning. sure that... Right, and it's and it's it's just an obvious violation of the American First Amendment. Um, and they would back it up with 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 implied threats of, well, if you don't stop, uh, if you don't censor along the lines that we want you to censor, we're going to go after you. We're going to go after you with our regulatory power. Yeah, th and this is like right out of the Soviet Union, and and they knew what they were promoting was not accurate. It was not factual. It was all political. It's stunning, isn't it? I mean, it it didn't matter if you're telling the truth or not. Right. So if you could point to, to scientific studies, peer reviewed scientific studies, and you could still get censored if it went against mm -hmm. the priorities of the of the uh, of the White House. Uh, there's this really interesting, really funny uh, thing that happened in one of the one of the uh, uh, we found in one of the discovery documents. Um, the uh, in t April of 2021, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, uh, the, the CDC uh, said that the Johnson and Johnson vaccine needed to be paused because they'd found a signal for strokes in women. Um, I don't know if you remember this in, in incident. Yeah. It was a big deal because the CDC, that I was do. the first time like the, the vaccine uptake sort of slowed up. Um, the White House had been pressuring Facebook to uh, to put, put into its algorithms to tag anyone that claimed that there were any vaccine injuries at all. Mm -hmm. Even true vaccine injuries, like, pa like the patient groups would pop up saying we have vaccine injuries and Facebook would suppress them because the White House told them they had to suppress them, even if they're true. When the CDC put a pause on the J&J &J vaccine, the White House shared the CDC announcement on its Facebook page. Mm -hmm. The algorithms that the White House itself had induced Facebook to put in place tagged the, the White House Facebook page as an anti-vax group because they had shared the CDC's announcement that, the, that it ought to be paused, the J&J &J vaccine ought to be paused. Wow. And then you have this like series of emails from Rob Flaherty, who was a, 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 a staffer inside the White House, like a major figure inside the White House, uh, yelling at Facebook saying, why are you treating us as, a, as if we're anti-vax? Uh, why have I, why has our page stopped growing? And so they got special treatment, unlike everybody else. They, they, they got to continue being an anti-vax group, whereas the rest of the, the, the people sharing vaccine injuries didn't get, to, didn't get that same kind of favor. It, it really is stunning. And I think people probably underestimated the amount of power that those government officials behind the scenes had um, over those tech companies, because obviously they all make their money, their their livelihoods through their licensing, and so if they if those all things those licenses are put in jeopardy, they're done. Uh, and I, I think that power was wielded to pull every political narrative that they wanted. It wasn't just COVID nineteen. Now it's just it's just like an octopus, isn't it, uh, Jay? Yeah, I mean, it, they used it to suppress uh, the speech of their political uh, adversaries. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's that is just str a straightforward First Amendment violation. But, I, you know, I, I can almost understand that. It's just raw, that's just raw politics. Yeah. And power. It's, it's unconstitutional and terrible right. and should not be done. But but you can kind of understand it. But then to use it to suppress scientific debate and discussion. Wow. I mean, I like what what what, what reasoning could there possibly be for that? Uh and I think um, I, I think the the American people, the Canadian people, once they start to see what happened, the manipulation mm -hmm. of the information environment by this censorship that led to tremendously bad and harmful decisions that may have caused uh, uh, you know I, I think that I think censorship caused a, a tremendous number of a number of deaths if you ask me indeed because if you think about it, the, a lot of the policies that were tremendously damaging the lockdown policies, mm -hmm. the school closures, they were all. Uh, put in place on the premise that scientists didn't de de uh, all scientists agreed that they needed to have them exactly but yeah the public was there drinking in all this information all on the assumption that what was being told there was a what was it again oh yes a consensus when in fact there was a raging debate that was being stifled by these crazy censors and uh yeah all out of power and uh, money and God knows what else. But in this context, um, I think sometimes people would not realize that this censorship was across the board um, in terms of all media, like in terms of mainstream media as well. They were all being, the, the documents are all coming out proving that kind of uh, coordination. It's, it's really kind of hard to believe. But in this context, it's across the Western world 
And uh, this is why some people may ask, well, why, did, why is this relevant to Canadians? Because so many Canadians get their information through social media, uh, the usual su suspects of mainstream media driven out of the United States. And it, it's, it's, so it's, this has really been a phenomenon that really had worldwide implications, did it not? It absolutely did. I mean, I, I can tell you from my colleagues in Canada uh, that the, it, the, it wasn't just the American government that was involved in this kind of mm -hmm. propaganda and censorship efforts. I mean, I think it was very difficult for Canadians also Indeed. to speak. Uh, and uh, the, the information environment in Canada, if, 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 if anything, was even more constrained than it was in the United States. Mm -hmm. The idea that I think, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, I was surprised to, to re realize how few Canadians had heard of the Great Barrington Declaration. Indeed. Essentially, the mainstream uh, Canadian press, like the CBC, I, I, they, I, they actually they actually straight up defamed me, Martin and Sinatra, accusing us of wanting to let the virus rip mm -hmm. right after we wrote the, 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 the declaration um, and wouldn't let us respond. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, they're supposed to be neutral, but they were not. And then after that, there was silence about it, right? So uh, the, the the Canadian people were subject to an information environment that misled them about the the science of the pandemic, the efficacy of the vaccines, uh, the necessity for vaccine mandates, uh, a, a whole host of uh, the efficacy of masking, a whole host of scientific issues that were hotly debated mm -hmm. in the scientific community, but within. Uh, the the information environment permitted by the by the uh, by the Canadian government uh, essentially so, so, uh, withheld those facts were withheld from the Canadian people. Indeed, so it, it, it's it just strikes me as an utter tragedy for people, any population, to be kept in kind of an information bubble where they do not know the basic debates. The uh, the truth and that kind of healthy discussion is is so vital. So this is again another revelation. And I think in the Canadian context is quite unnerving. We just had another uh, uh, financial uh, update and, and budget where additional monies now are being spent on the media. Some 2,000 media outlets receive significant media funding. And so again, it, it begs the issue to what extent is the media really serving the public uh, with this kind of information. So it's, uh, it's a big challenge. But I think in itself, this kind of case is very significant, uh, the Missouri case that you are a, platen, a plaintiff in. And what's fascinating is that this is now being appealed by the Biden administration to the U.S. Supreme Court. So tell us more about the timing around that and what do you think is going to happen? Uh, okay, so just, just briefly, uh, the, the, the original case was brought in August of 2022. On July 4th, 2023, we had a, uh, a, a, a dis the district court, the lower court, the federal court ruled in our favor and ordered the Biden administration in a preliminary injunction to to stop forcing social media to censor ideas and people. A huge victory. I was so pleased. I mean, I, I wrote a, <laughs> a pretty triumphant, I mean, I'll probably jump the gun on how triumphant it was kind of piece uh, mm -hmm. about it. Uh, I was, but I was very pleased because, you know, it's like it's, a, it's a, the restoration of First Amendment and free speech rights in a, in a, a major country is a big deal. Um, and then uh, the Biden administration appealed to a, a, a appeals court in Louisiana in, in the Fifth Circuit uh, court, which then had a three judge panel that ruled in our favor. All three judges saying e exactly the same thing. Now, they narrowed the range of the preliminary injunction. So uh, the, the original circuit court. Uh, the original district court, what it found was that they, what they ordered in the preliminary injunction was the Biden administration can't order censorship, and also they can't go to private entities and to to, to generate a list for set, like a, a essentially to to launder the censorship efforts off to private entities mm -hmm. and and generate a list of a hit list of censorship. The 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 appeals court said that the Biden administration is not allowed to do the first thing. They're not allowed to go to the social media companies and threaten them for censoring, but they are allowed to like engage with public, uh, you know, the entities and uh, nonprofit entities to try to uh, look for misinformation mm -hmm. that that's permitted, but the first is not. Um, the Biden administration appealed the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court is now going to hear the case, uh, which is a big deal in and of itself. The Supreme Court doesn't Grant uh, uh, cert, I guess, is the, what the lawyers say. You you know more than me, David. Right. Um, uh, grant cert to very many cases, but they they have agreed to hear our case, and we should hear it sometime. They should be hearing it sometime in the late uh, winter, early spring. Um, um, that will be a big indicator because if the Supreme Court rules in our favor, then it's very likely we will win the case itself, which will go back down to the lower court 
uh, after, uh, and hopefully we'll have a preliminary injunction in place that will uh, force this Biden administration to stop violating the First Amendment. Indeed. So this is a big deal, and there's been some significant victories here. Um, the the cases are a bit nuanced, but I, you know, I, I know it's hard to know what the U.S. Supreme Court will do, but based on certainly the precedents I've seen, uh, from my humble opinion, I think that we have reason to be optimistic. So stay tuned, and uh, Godspeed as you go to the U.S. Supreme Court on that one, Jay. Thank you. So we do have, um, gosh, another set of bombshells. We've all heard about the Twitter files when Elon Musk acquired Twitter, really a crime scene. And uh, he had a whole uh, cadre, a team of, of um, crack journalists uh, swarm on those files uh, to bring some investigative journalism to bear to find out what was really going on. And again, that was really quite, uh, quite profound. And then would you believe... It wasn't enough for uh, people like uh, Matt Taibbi and uh, Michael Schellenberger to get in there uh, and find out yet another second revelation uh, just recently. Um, and this had to do with really confirmation, I think, of a, a, a whole different level of censorship again. So we've kind of had a bit of gray drip by drip revelation through the Twitter files that there's censorship going on. But this is something else. This shows that there was actually a real agency the last several years whose concerted mission, job priority number one, if you say, that was all about censorship on a whole host of issues. So the, it's almost like the image is becoming clearer and clearer. So Jay, you've been again involved in that revelation. So can you help us explain what's really going on there? Yeah, so uh, I mean, it's it's uh, the the situation is complicated, but I think I can try to simplify it. Uh, so first, there the 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 uh, the censorship effort predated the pandemic. Mm -hmm. That there the, the, there were there were groups, some associated with military, like the U, the U.S. Yeah. military yeah. and uh, and others, uh, that formed to try to control conversations online on the premise that foreign actors were were trying to. Uh, propagandize propagandize people mm -hmm. through, through uh now these these uh, these actors were f at, at first i think private but very then very quickly they were they engaged with uh actors inside the the u.s federal government like the like the state department and, and others uh and and when 2020 hit they shifted to control of speech over covid speech about covid and also over the elections in the united the united states mm -hmm. Um, and they 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 uh, they they essentially uh, formed what what I would call a public private partnership aimed at censorship, um, engaging vast numbers of people both inside the government and out to try to control the speech of people online and elsewhere. We also have an interesting twist to it as well. It's not surprising because its backbone is the intelligence defense network. But that is also the Five Eyes Agreement, which relates to Canada, New Zealand, the UK, and of course, Australia. So the implications are not totally clear in this, but what is clear is we have a lot of agencies in our governments that their job, they see it as censorship. It's not about enabling uh, information. It's not about enabling, um, dare I say, democracy. It's something else. And... Uh, I mean, this for me is, again, another revelation that we've got a huge problem as we look at our societies and our needs to renew them. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the cooperation among, uh, you know, Canada, Australia, the UK, the US on this is truly shocking. Um, and what it means that then is that, uh, I mean, it's the kind of it's the kind of propaganda activities that might once have been used against foreign adversaries. But instead, the, this apparatus to to control how people think based on the control of the information environment that people are bathed in, um, that has been deployed against the people, the peoples of the free world, mm -hmm. by the governments of the free once upon a time free world, I should say. Um, like you, you, uh, the picture is still muddy to me. I mean, I, I think the, the the revelations are truly shocking, but they're not. But the but the picture hasn't yet come come into focus. But what we have seen, what's it's, what's very clear, is that. Uh, entities that ought to be ha ought to have been working to safeguard 
free conversation, free free speech. Instead, use their power over media, over social media, over governments uh, to, to try to use that power to suppress speech of political opponents and, and scientific opponents on, uh, in, on, online in order to, to get their way on policies that they otherwise never would have had a chance to get had they uh, allowed normal processes like and civil rights to operate. Well said, and, and it is truly uh, a frightening paradox that you had government actors instructively and knowingly censoring and blocking the vigorous debate that needs to be happening about vital issues on every topic imaginable from elections to um, all kinds of policy issues and including health and the management of COVID-19. In that environment, without open and free discussion, you are no longer able to engage science in the search for truth. If you think that uh, a pandemic, an emergency is the right time to censor, uh, you're, 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 you're essentially, what you're saying is that, that uh, in the most complicated situations where it is the most uncertainty, we should reduce the number of brains thinking about a topic. It's exactly backwards, David. What, it what, is. What, especially when during an emergency, you need to have the most, uh, the the most free speech. That is how you get to the best results. Because there really isn't, uh, you know, a godlike power in, in someone like Tony Fauci, for instance, who 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 it embodies science and then therefore can distinguish true from false unerringly. That no no one like that exists. Um, and and to, essentially the premise of this censorship power is that, oh, well, if we if we know what's true, we just have to stop all these uh, crazy people online, like, you know, Jay, Martin, and Sinatra, uh, from spreading their message, and then we can get our way. Mm -hmm. Well, th the problem is the premise to begin with. Like, there is no monopoly on the truth held by people like Tony Fauci. Indeed. Uh, the, 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 there needs to be on a discussion, a vigorous discussion. That's how you get at the truth. No one is right all the time. And it's by that debate and discussion that you inch toward the truth. That's that was always the wisdom and the genius of uh, of the free world was to permit that to happen, even during the most difficult times, especially during the most difficult times. And during the pandemic, um, m most of the free world decided to go the other way. Indeed, and and I, you know, I just commend uh, you and and Martin and and Sunita Gupta for speaking up profoundly about this issue, among so many others in Canada and uh, around the world who were frankly treated so poorly and censored. And, um, uh, you know, it was so many ad hominem attacks, it was disgusting. And so, and yet you carried forward uh, with the courage and conviction that the truth mattered uh, to your fellow citizens and their health. And, and for me, this is um, really quite a, a significant time in our history where the question becomes, dare we get engaged as citizens and speak up and renew our country um, to allow civilization to continue in some measure? I know this sounds incredibly, you know, histrionic or dramatic, but th that's not that's not overstating it, is it, Jay? No, I think I think that that uh, I mean, the way I think uh, is, I mean, our, our our republics are really at stake here. Right. If you don't have free speech, you don't have a free republic. You don't have a free people. It is the core civil right, and uh, a, a a country, a government that decides that it will go, abrogate those rights is no longer a democracy. It's no longer a republic. It is something else entirely. It's an authoritarian power that stands over us. Um, I don't think that is overstating the case. I mean, I, I don't recognize the American Republic if it doesn't have free speech at its core. Uh, and uh, it is really truly at risk at this point. It, it, was, it, it was we didn't have free speech during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And the question is, will that power now that governments have used it and deployed it at scale continue to be allowed to be used at scale? I mean, I, I hope we win the Missouri versus Biden case. But, you know, I look around the world and I see, uh, for instance, Ireland passing a law. Indeed. That abrogates free speech rights for people online um, in the name of safety. The free world is headed backwards I agree. And, and in fact, um, one of the things that we did want to show within this discussion, Jay, was a clip from Michael Schellenberger talking a little bit about uh, the case of Ireland. And uh, he does show that here. It sounds like a Black Mirror episode. 
the police can enter your home unannounced, search your phone and computers, and arrest you for the things that you're reading, watching, or posting online. If you refuse, you could be sentenced to 12 months in prison. But it's not a Black Mirror episode. It's worse than that. It's real life. At this very moment, the government of Ireland is trying to pass a law before Christmas that will let the police go into people's homes and confiscate their phones and computers. Now you might think Ireland doesn't matter, that it could disappear tomorrow without much impact. But Ireland does matter. It's the test case for the next phase of the global crackdown by military and intelligence forces and their agents that's been happening over the last seven years. What they used to call a conspiracy theory has now been confirmed as true. Our research has exposed a far-reaching plan by military and intelligence agencies in the United States, Britain, and other nations to subvert the democratic process and engage in activities that have a basis in military techniques and which are tantamount to attempts at thought control. This isn't about censoring the far right. This is about censoring independent journalism. And if you're in Ireland, this is about censoring you. One understandable response to all of this is to ignore it and hope it goes away or wish that it won't affect you. And maybe it won't, but our ancestors fought and died for the right to speak our truths, particularly about controversial cultural and political issues. And already we're fighting back and making progress. The Irish government was forced to back off this law once already, and we can make them back off again. Free thinkers in the United States and around the world must stand up now for Ireland. We have to fight the totalitarians over there so that we don't have to fight them over here. We need to send a message to the politicians and the police that the world stands with the people of Ireland and their first and fundamental right. Please share this message and consider donating to a special free speech fund at censorshipindustrialcomplex.org. If we don't act now, our children and grandchildren will look back at this moment and ask why we didn't do more while we still had a chance. So please get involved now and stop this Black Mirror episode from becoming real life. So one of the, the questions I have for you is that this whole policy debate and discussion seems to be linked to not only the, the suppression of information, the censorship in so many areas uh, at a national level. It, it, it's, it's connected in a peculiar way to international bodies that are, seem to be working across every international jurisdiction. And we, we know the, uh, the parties well, the World Health Organization for starters, and there's so many of them. But it, it seems to me that this is a kind of um, a, a particular international initiative that is kind of sidestepping uh, democratic structures and the ability for people to have a voice in any decision making. How is this interrelated from your perspective? I mean, it's interesting. We met some, uh, what was it, uh, two, two years ago in London, England, really on a conference related to this, trying to figure out what was really going on here. But there were particular relationships being made among all these parties, among the usual suspects. It wasn't just the Gates Foundation. It wasn't just simply the Rockefeller Foundation. There were so many others that were almost working together as a team to advance this kind of thinking that um, that has led us to where we are. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I, I, some of that stuff is about my pay, pay grade, David. So let me just let me just focus on the things I do know for certain, right? So let's just talk about the World Health Organization. And uh, the, 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 right now what's happening is the World Health Organization is in the midst of writing a new pandemic treaty. Indeed, yes. That will greatly expand the set of powers that the World Health Organization will have to compel action by signatories in the context of another pandemic. Uh, that those powers, uh, I mean, if and you know, if the tree is not yet written, it's, it'll be written, I think, uh, it's supposed to be spring of next year will be done. And then there'll be, hopefully there'll be vigorous discussion about whether countries like Canada and the U.S. within them, whether we should sign them. Um, uh, but I, but I, in effect, what that does is if if the U.S. and Canada, or whatever country signs that treaty, it will allow Canada, uh, the World Health Organization to abrogate basic civil rights in the name of pandemic management. That's the that's the basic upshot, right? It will, it and the, and the not like if you read the the kind of uh, propaganda around it, the the World Health Organization will say, well, the, no, there's no formal power 
Uh, we're not we're not going to, you know, obviously we're going to rely on cooperation. But what we've seen the playbook during the pandemic Indeed. when you have the public health authorities ring the bell, a panic bell, people panic all, all over the world. And they're very, very willing to give up basic civil liberties mm -hmm. in the name of promise of security from uh, from a from a pathogen. That's a tremendous power, even if it's not formal. And the World Health Organization's pandemic treaty makes it easier for them to ring that panic bell, to, to go into countries and, and that are the recalcitrant. Uh, the premise is that if we don't all act together as one world when a pathogen happens, we won't be able to control it. Well, we've seen the problem, right? It's when you have a pathogen that, that's spreading, spreading wildly, even concerted action by governments are, is not capable of control. It's an illusion of control mm -hmm. that doesn't exist. I do think, uh, you know, I think it's not unreasonable to want to have countries report, uh, you know, if they find a new pathogen, report to the world quickly that that, that I mean, that's not an unreasonable thing. But this, this pandemic treaty, if I understand the, the direction it's headed, goes far beyond that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, the, the, the second question I have is a question of trust. Indeed, the World Health yeah. Organization tremendously failed during the pandemic. Is, is this the kind of organization that you want to have that kind of expansive power, given the way that it uh, deployed uh, less power during the pandemic to cause panic around the world and to cause uh, uh, bad policies like lockdowns to spread everywhere? Indeed. To be clear, how can one have active, engaged public health care policy if you don't have a measure of trust with decision makers, it doesn't work. No, that's the key piece. Uh, I mean, it's not like a military thing where it matters how many missiles you mm -hmm. have. Trust is the most important, uh, uh, the, the most important like uh, uh, asset that any public health agency has. Um, the the public health agencies of the world have dis essentially dissipated the the trust that the public once had in them. Vast numbers of people no longer believe the utterances of public health authorities because they abused that that trust during the pandemic. Um, the World Health Organization, in particular, I think, bears a, a tremendous role, a negative role in that. Um, and so, and they they come asking for more power. Essentially, I guess that the the argument is they failed because they didn't have sufficient power last time. Well, they didn't use the power that they had last time in a trustworthy way. Mm -hmm. they, you know, uh, just going back to the Great Barrington Declaration, right after we wrote the Great Barrington Declaration, the World Health Organization changed its definition of herd immunity to exclude uh, infection-acquired immunity, yeah. something that the, the ancient Athenians knew about. No, it was exactly. like basic scientific facts. Um, they, they were using their power essentially to push forward a false epidemiological message in service of, of vaccine companies. Um, it's an abuse of trust. I mean, abuse of power, abuse of trust. I mean, so I think that the World Health Organization needs to go back to the drawing board. If it wants more power, it first needs to uh, have much more effective, uh, 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 much effective support for civil rights, basic civil rights. They should make a commitment to never vi to recommend the violation of civil rights ever again, as they did during the pandemic, um, and then make that concrete. And then second, they, they need to have less corporate control like you know the, the world health Organization, a very large chunk of it is funded by the gates foundation why do we have one private philanthropy have so much power mm -hmm. over a, a international organization like that that's a, that's entirely inappropriate if they, what it needs to it needs to divest itself of that kind of corporate power uh, at its center and then third it it needs to it needs to respect the autonomy of countries much much more effect, uh, than 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 it than it currently does. Uh, I think even with all those three, it needs to, and it needs to fundamentally transform its scientific, uh, uh, scientific advice that it gets so that it doesn't have uh, sort of this monolithic advice by a, a small cabal of scientists who push, push a narrative. They need to have much more broader set of scientific voices at the core. Uh, those at the very least would be necessary before I start to trust the World Health Organization again. Well said. I like your vision, uh, Jay, for um, frankly renewing uh, not just simply public health, but science. Uh, and I know we've talked uh, with uh, Dr. Martin Koldorf about this as well. We need to decentralize a lot of the funding, the decision-making, the power, uh, so that we engender uh, vigorous scientific uh, debate. Uh, you can't go wrong with those foundational principles. And certainly uh, 
those are very important to stick up for. So bravo on you. So as we look to the future, we have a lot of major revelations and things to look forward to in 2024. And um, one of the signs of hope I have is, is certainly the actions of citizens. I think of the National Citizens Inquiry in Canada and uh, their incredible work across the country. And I think of, of course, the truckers convoy who were, as Dr. Martin Kuldorf said, they were following the science in their cabs as they listened to all kinds of things on their way to Ottawa to kind of raise the flag literally for common sense. Where do you see the signs of hope and how do you think citizens can play a greater role in bringing uh, sanity back to our world in, in uh, public health? Uh, so first of all, b both of those entities, the, 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 uh, the National Inquiry that in the UK, uh, in, in, in Canada, uh, and the truckers are heroes to me. I mean, they, they have done yeoman's work that governments ought to have been doing. Um, the truckers in particular, they really transformed the policy. They, 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 the policy, is, especially in Canada, was, was discriminatory and anti-scientific. They were uh, essentially marginalizing the lives of anyone who decided not to get the vaccine in, in ways that had nothing to do with the efficacy of the vaccines. It was just pure, raw, discriminate, discriminatory power. Um, and the, the Canadian truckers, by their very effective protest, put an end to that. And they, to me, they're like tremendous heroes. The citizen inquiry is also a model of how these inquiries ought to be run. You can see the opposite. Like, for instance, in the UK, they're running an inquiry where it's incredibly yes. one-sided. They, they come with the premise that, oh, oh, well, we should have locked down earlier. Had we locked down earlier, everything would have been fine. And then with that lens, uh, at talking to every single person who made tremendous mistakes during the pandemic, but not in the direction they're suggesting, mm -hmm. um, they, they, uh, they're continuing to have this one voice uh, which got basically everything wrong at the center of their inquiry, whereas the National Citizen Inquiry in Canada is quite the opposite. They have quite a diverse set of voices uh, giving giving uh, giving their testimony, and as a result, the, the end product is much more sensible. Um, so, yeah, so I think I think that those are certainly fantastic areas of hope. Um, I, I I do think that um, it will be more difficult. I think many many people now looking around you know, almost four years on, realize that the, the pandemic policies we follow were tremendous failures. They look at, at the damage to their kids, the, to kids' psyches. They're, they're, they look at the, the, the vast inflation that are happening, the, the budgetary impacts, uh, the, the, the economic impacts. We're kind of waking up with the hangover of the, the excesses of the last three years, three or three and a half plus years. Um, and, and I think that that to me is a source of hope. I don't think that people really want to, to entrust the kinds of entities that made those decisions with the same kind of power again, now that they under, they're starting to understand what a catastrophic mistake that they would made to begin with. Well said. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya for joining us. And I certainly wish you and your family and your colleagues every success as we get into 2024. And we're grateful that we could have this discussion and thank you for your courage and your leadership. Thank you, David. So great to talk with you as always. Thank you. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.